My name is David Norrish. Hi, I'm Pranay Jayam. I am the Deputy Director of Division of Monetary Affairs. Um, my name is Christina Harstead, so today I guess I'm William English. Um, I'm Peter Urich. I'm uh, Satyajit Zadavra. And Victoria Tran. Judges? Uh, my name is Alex Sobrek. I'm an Associate Professor of Economics and the Executive Director of the Eastern Economic Association. I participated in the High School Fed Challenge in 1996. Oh, awesome. Cool. There's a future for you. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a good or bad future. <laughs> I, leave, I stay silent on that point. Good morning. Um, I'm Roy Webb. I'm a senior economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Hi, I'm Stacy Tevlin. I'm the chief of macroeconomic analysis here at the board. All right, I have the, I have the timer set for 20 minutes. I have a two-minute warning card and a please finish. So as soon as you're ready, I will start the timer. Ready? Let's go. Good morning, gentlemen. You should all have copies of the blue books in front of you. Now, I have a meeting with Chairman Bernanke later today, and he's asked me to discuss whether or not that we think that we should change the size and scope of quantitative easing. He'd also like me to discuss with him any monetary policy tools that we think we should use in terms of communications. And also, I'd really like to elicit your opinions on what you think that we should recommend for the December FOMC meeting. Now, keep in mind that during the last statement, we really stressed the dual mandate. So anything that we suggest has to take into account full employment and price level. I would just like to reemphasize that quantitative easing is not going to help either of those objectives. All it's going to do is create long-term instability in that system. Pranay, I cannot believe that you continue to remain skeptical about how essential quantitative easing was. I mean, we've been out of the recession for over a year at this point, and we're still looking at one of the highest unemployment numbers we've had in almost three decades, 9.6%. Also, if you look at long-term unemployment, over 40% of unemployed workers are long-term unemployed. This means that their skills become obsolete. The stigma with become employed decli unemployed declines. You also get them use, more used to a lower standard of living. We certainly want to prevent the onset of hysteresis. Absolutely, and the outlook for employment is even darker if we look at some of the alternative measures of unemployment. After accounting for the marginally attached workers and the underemployed, the nation is looking at an unemployment rate that is potentially as high as 17%. Any insufficiency in the monetary stimulus that we provide at this point will only prolong the weaknesses in the labor markets. It is my firm belief that quantitative easing will spur business investment and hiring. As you can see on page three, business sentiment surveys are already indicating a positive reception to QE2. If conditions in the labor markets deteriorate further, I would strongly advocate further quantitative easing. I agree. If you look at the output gap, we are below projected levels. This means that aggregate demand is not sufficient enough. Now granted, GDP growth expectations for the future are positive, but they are not fast enough to quickly alleviate unemployment. Both GDP forecasts and unemployment forecasts have been downgraded since the last FOMC meeting. And right now, uh, we have a situation of aggregate demand not being sufficient enough. Investment is not sufficient enough due to residential housing. Consumption is weak due to the wealth effect and elevated unemployment, and we certainly cannot expect any more government spending. Now, quantitative easing will work to increase liquidity, which will lower interest rates to spur aggregate demand. But Peter, you're overlooking all the structural problems in the economy that are causing that employment slack. If you just look at the survey of small businesses, it's clear that regulatory reforms are required and a big problem today. How do you expect businesses to start hiring if they do not know what their medical insurance costs and taxes are going to be going forward? Not to mention that Congress passed a 99-week extension of unemployment benefits. That creates a huge incentive for workers to not go out and find new jobs. I completely agree with you. As we know that it's about to expire, employment numbers have already started improving. You can see that in the October numbers now. At this point, I do not understand why we're using monetary policy to try and solve structural problems, especially with economic indicators improving. Consumer sentiment is going up, recession probabilities are extremely low, household net worth is good, and total retail sales are also rising. Speaking of further structural problems, many economists believe that the Nehru has adjusted upwards, and many believe that it's due to increased productivity in the private sector. That means that firms can produce the same amount of output while still having fewer employees. Also, there are increasing capital and labor flows that are going to emerging markets, and obviously the trade-off for that is that capital and labor being utilized here. You know, David, time and again I've heard opponents of quantitative easing speak about these so-called structural issues in the labor markets, but there is a graph on page 8 which tracks unemployment by industry, and it's fairly clear that the weaknesses in the labor markets are persistent throughout the economy. They're not specific to any particular sector. Given that, I think this hints at cyclical issues much more than at structural ones, 
And although the Nehru may have adjusted upwards slightly, it's unreasonable to suggest that structural issues explain the highly elevated unemployment numbers we're looking at. Once again, any insufficiency in the monetary stimulus we provide at this point would be a blatant disregard of our full employment mandate. Gee, this monetary expansion is not going to help. It might just end up like quantitative easing one, where there's a build-up in excess reserves, but the actual loans in the economy do not increase. Pranay, you bring up something I myself have been thinking about, and perhaps it's time we start countering that build-up and maybe stop making those interest payments on excess reserves. You can clearly see there's little or no correlation between interest on excess reserves and the build-up of excess reserves. The entire point of having interest on excess reserves is so that the Fed funds rate does not go to the zero bound. And so that we can actually function in a normal economy and our uh, policies do function properly. And money market funds need the interest and excess reserves in order to properly function. Also, without the authority to pay interest on excess reserve, the desk from time to time has had difficulty keeping the federal funds rate above very low levels. What happens is that when we do pay interest on excess reserves, the market participants have little assentance to arrange transactions below the federal funds rate. Also, uh, pardon me, below the rate paid on excess. Also, what this does is it effectively sets a floor on market rates and it helps the Fed, the desk, hit the target. Now, if we look at back to the dual mandate, right now the unemployment problem is only exacerbated by the housing market. Right now, 20% of borrowers are underwater on their mortgages, which means they cannot move to new locations to secure jobs. Another 33% of homeowners are at risk of being added to that statistic because they have equity cushions of 10% or less. Now, if we look at the Case-Shiller Index, it does suggest that prices have bottomed out, even though the announcement today was that prices have trended slightly lower. Also, the loan for residential mortgage loan demand, there was an increase in demand in 2009. However, this demand was artificial, and it was due to the federal tax credits that expired this year. Also, loan demand standards remain elevated. And even though in the last three months, loan standards have slightly decreased, loan standards will not return to their long-run averages any time in the foreseeable future. However, one of the biggest issues I have right now with the housing market is that delinquencies are 2.7 times their historical averages. But right now, the inventories are foreclosures are 7.4 times their normal averages, and we expect them to increase because the moratorium on foreclosures has recently ended. In, um, aside from the dual mandate, we really need to focus on the housing market because it significantly factors into inflation, and it's a large proponent of aggregate demand. Indeed, the housing market has been one of the weakest links in the recovery that we've had so far, and one of our primary motivators behind further credit easing has been to lower longer-term interest rates to bolster mortgage markets and help the recovery in housing markets. And although in recent weeks inflation expectations have worked to drive up mortgage rates, it's clear from the trend we can see on page 12 that following uh, Chairman Bernanke's an initial announcements of QE2 at the Jackson Hole speech, I think it's reasonable to say that credit easing will keep longer the mortgage rates subdued and this should bolster home sales and help out the housing markets. And David Pernay, even if unemployment is not your primary objective, you have to look at the second aspect of the dual mandate, inflation. It's below the usual 2% levels. Just look at the core PCE index. Now, what quantitative easing 2 does, it, it's aimed to also increase inflation expectations. And if you look at the market inflation expectations and the tip spreads, they had been falling until quantitative easing 2 became a possibility. And the inflation survey by the University of Michigan tells a similar story. Now, because our dual mandate right now is not at odds with each other, inflation expectations will uh, spur aggregate demand, which will actually raise actual inflation and also lower unemployment. And if you look at the expectations long term, they are also much closer to the usual 2% levels now. Absolutely. I completely agree with Peter. And I think there are even more transmission mechanisms through which quantitative easing is already helping the economy. It's empirically evident that the dollar has been following, uh, has been falling after the initial announcements of QE2. And although the European sovereign debt crisis has worked in recent weeks to appreciate it, it's reasonable to expect it to settle at a level much more favorable to exports. Certainly a desirable outcome. But that's just one side of the argument. You've already seen Brazil, China, Germany speak against such a devaluation. You might just lead up to a currency war. That might lead up to a long-term instability in the world markets. Pranay, certainly there are valid international concerns. For instance, at the G20 summit, things such as capital flow controls were discussed. However, it is my opinion that these concerns have related to a prolonged period of expansionary policy in the West that has spurred a hunt for yield. They're not necessarily about competitive devaluations. I mean, we're not going out and buying foreign currencies at this point. As a matter of fact, the ECB and the Bank of England met 
the same week that we announced the second stage of quantitative easing, and they clearly decided not to pursue further quantitative easing. Actually, the Reserve Bank of Austria has even moved to raise interest rates. Thank you, Peter. So these are not the actions of central banks that are worried about a major player trying to competitively devalue its currency. The dollar remains a robust currency, and the slight devaluation at this point is only a natural adjustment. It makes no sense to compromise our domestic recovery because of unjustified international concerns about competitive devaluation. All right. You guys are talking about raising inflation. However, there's a very real chance that further quantitative easing will just raise inflation to unacceptable levels. If you look at M2, over the past several months, it has grown rapidly, not to mention the fact that our balance sheet has grown at unprecedented levels, if you look, which are all putting potential pressure on prices. If you look at the composite commodity and equities charts, you see that there's upward pressure on prices, both as the economy continues to recover and with the continual pursuance of quantitative easing. But what we really need to look at is the excess reserves that are currently being held at the Fed, the approximately $1 trillion worth. Once banks feel that there is significant inflation risk, they will take their money out of excess reserves and put them into any market they feel that they can get a higher yield. And that will, that will possibly cause price bubbles and instability wherever that money decides to go. I think I share some of those concerns. Also, I'm not a complete believer in your tips argument, Peter. As you know, in our purchases, we have distorted the spread, especially as we are an inflation-insensitive buyer. Yes, you're right. Perhaps the numerical value of the tip spreads is distorted, but the main thing you have to look at is the trends. There was a downward trend until quantitative easing to became a possibility, and the inflation survey shows similar information. All right, well, we're talking about the Fed buying all these different treasury securities, but what we really need to worry about is credibility and independence. Right now, with all the political pressure, it's, people realize that when we buy all these different treasury securities, it decreases the cost for the federal government to borrow, and that gives them a huge incentive to create larger deficits. And as we know, the, the deficit is one of the main structural problems facing the U.S. economy right now. Dave, any serious economist or international institution knows we are not trying to monetize the debt. We are paying a quarter percent interest on excess reserves. We are not giving free money to the U.S. government. It's a policy that does not maximize seniorage. Peter, it's not about what we think. It's about what the general public thinks. And if you've noticed, there's been considerable political pressure being put on the Fed because of quantitative easing, too. Now, I feel that we need to be very keen of public... Uh, perception of our actions as we conduct our policy. Dave, as with every meeting, I do hear you loud and clear. However, we do want to maintain independence and credibility. But if you look at the context of our dual mandate, quantitative easing is an appropriate solution. It has elicited positive market reactions, and we did leave a lot of openness in the language to say that we'll actively monitor market conditions and change our plans accordingly. At this time, I'm not going to suggest to the chairman that we change the scope or timing of quantitative easing. However, if you move on, the Chairman Bernanke has really been focusing on the importance of inflation expectations and how we should manage them going forward. So how can we do this in a manner that will make quantitative easing more effective? All right, guys. One thing that I've been advocating over the past several years and feel that is especially important now is that we adopt an explicit inflation target. Once we adopt an explicit inflation target, it sets market expectations around that target. And that makes it much easier for the central bank to manage inflation expectations. Just look at the New Zealand central bank and the ECB. They all have explicit inflation targets, and they have been very successful at controlling inflation levels. Well, what about nominal GDP targeting? It, impl it takes into account both aspects of the dual mandate and aims to stabilize growth as well as price levels. And during recessions, it raises inflation expectations, which lowers real interest rates, and this boosts aggregate demand. This would have certainly been useful in the last recession. Furthermore, it's a much better PR move, whereas inflation and price level targeting implies that the value of your money is falling. Nominal GDP uh, targeting is seen that nominal wages will also rise for workers along with nominal GDP. Peter, nominal GDP targeting hasn't been implemented by any central bank anywhere. However, uh, explicit inflation target has been implemented by over 20 different central banks, not to mention it's been researched by various branches of the Fed, Congress, and noted economist Rick Mishkin and Chairman Bernanke himself. I feel that in this period where our dual mandate is not mutually exclusive, an expl a temporary explicit inflation target will help to raise inflation expectations and will help to raise aggregate demand without the need for further quantitative easing. Actually, Dave, I think I do agree with you on this point. If we make our... Um, if we make our target for core inflation explicit in the short term, this can help to increase communication with the market and help to set expectations. However, since we do have a dual mandate, unlike the other central banks you mentioned, I don't believe explicit inflation targeting is sustainable over the long term, but in the short term, it could be an effective tool. 
However, Peter, nominal GDP targeting sounds interesting, but I do not think it's ready to be implemented on a large scale yet. We can continue to monitor and develop it internally. All right, so let's turn to the alternative communication language chart on page 29. What language do you suggest for the December FOMC meeting? Well, my problem right now is the language exceptionally low for an extended period. I think it provides us with no explicit flexibility to change our policies given any unforeseen economic events. I would suggest going from a time-based constraint to an indicator-based constraint. I would go with alternative B to say that we will warrant an accommodative interest rate until indicators improve. Peter, I have to go ahead and disagree with you on that. I think the current language that we've been using is actually very lucid and clearly states the motivations behind our actions. And as Christina said, it does give us the flexibility we need. It states that we will continue to monitor the economic outlook and make the necessary alterations. So given the context of the new monetary policy tools that we're using, it does give us the flexibility that we need. And in my opinion, one of the most salient features of the current language is that it clearly asserts our commitment to any monetary stimulus that will be required to fulfill the dual mandate. So at this juncture, making changes to the language that we're using will only add another layer of uncertainty to an already uncertain outlook. I understand your concerns, but my suggestion would be to at least be a little more positive in terms of our language. As you know, our language is looked upon almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Based on that, if we make it more positive, especially with the economic indicators that are there today, I think it might just help to improve business sentiment today. All right, so we've talked about the language. What about the actual numerical value of the Fed funds rate? All right, guys, don't even get me started on the federal funds rate. I've been advocating for the past several meetings that we need to have a more normal monetary policy like Prane was talking about, and that will start with raising interest rates to 1%. And keeping with our language of having it be an accommodative policy, I still think that 1% is still very accommodative to the markets. Having interest rates at zero is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy like Prane was talking about. It signals to the markets that we believe that the economy is going to be weak for an extended period of time. Let us also not forget that zero bound interest rates have inherent risks in them, such as the mispricing of risk and the malfunctioning of capital markets. In our long, keeping in mind our long-term objective of economic growth and stability, we need, to, we need to consider that the past economic crises were caused by uh, rates being excessively low for an extended period. So we do not want to show another bubble in the economy by keeping rates uh, artificially low. Dave, we've been talking about raising inflation expectations to spur aggregate demand and alleviate unemployment, and now you're talking about a contractionary policy. You can't be serious. Peter, actually, I think Dave makes an interesting point. You have to keep a long-term mandate in mind when you make any kind of decision. And based on the economic indicators present today, with the S&P 500 rising, <coughs> consumer sentiment being positive, market inflation expectations rising, GDP growth forecast being positive. That's the fact, not to mention the fact that the BEA has revised uh, the third quarter GDP estimates upwards. That means that people uh, and see that the economy is growing faster than they originally thought. I agree. And financial stress is moderate, and employment is also improving. Not to mention record corporate profits in the financial system. Agreed. And now that the midterm elections are over, some of those problems in terms of uh, policies that we expect can actually be solved. Based on that, we should at least look at tightening the range from 0 to 25 to 15 to 25 basis points. Well, I can't fully get behind it because it's not an increase to 1%. At least we'll be showing the markets that we don't perceive us going to the zero bound interest rates. I disagree with tightening the range. There is still a good amount of uncertainty in domestic markets and even more in the global markets. Look at the European sovereign debt crisis, the uncertainty about Asian monetary policies. All this will mean that a move like that could be seen as a contractionary move. Actually, Peter, it would only be a change to the language. It wouldn't be a change to the actual Fed funds rate. If you look at the graph, the effective rate has been oscillating between 15 to 25 basis points. However, the language can be taken as contractionary. So I think at this point, we can keep the zero to a quarter rate, but internally attempt to target 15 to 25 basis points. Later, we could add the tightened range language to a future announcement after the dust of QE2 has settled. I couldn't agree more. One of the main lessons we can get from the Japanese last decade has been that any premature tightening at this point will only undo all the positive benefits that we've reaped so far from an accommodative policy stance. Yes, G. Now, if we look at page 30, I'm going to suggest that we implement the draft that we made for the next statement. I'm going to suggest that we use the language in alternative B, which does not change the stated rate of the Fed funds rate. However, pairs this with a more positive language because we do see the economic indicators have improved and we want to, inc we want to tell the markets that we do see a normalized policy in the future. 
Also, implicit inflation target could be explicit for core inflation, and I'm thinking for about eight quarters in the future, we could communicate with this with the market to help inflation expectations. Nominal GDP targeting is something that is very interesting as a possible monetary policy rule, but I do not think it is ready for implementation at this time. At this point, I think that quantitative easing too is helping to achieve both objectives and our dual, of our dual mandate. And I don't think that we have enough feedback from the market to change either the size nor the scope of quantitative easing. So I think we should continue on our purchases and continue reinvesting the proceeds that we have from quantitative easing one. All right, gentlemen, I need to go and meet with the chairman. I'd like to thank you all for your input. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, we really appreciate it being animated this late in the day. <laughs> um, it really shows that you care about things, and we care about things. Um, <laughs> Let me begin by asking about inflation expectations. Your chart has longer-term measures of inflation expectations. Um, what do we know about short-term inflation expectations? Short-term inflation expectations have, in fact, remained subdued and consistently below mandate, consistent levels, which is one of the reasons that we are continuing our securities purchases and one of the uh, primary drivers of discussion at recent FOMC meetings. Also, uh, but a recent survey that was just released shows that people believe that there is significant amount of inflation already present in the economy and uh, that they expect that inflation to slightly rise as things are going, which is, again, shown in the tip spread. Yeah, building on that, there was an article, I believe it was yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, where they, where they ex are exactly talking about that. And that, I believe, shows a disconnect between um, overall consumers and the Fed. And I believe that the Fed needs to do a better job of communicating um, it's how it, how it understands that what people are going through, and they need to communicate the, the core PC better, I think. Now, when you mentioned that expectations are below the mandate consistent level, what measure of uh, expectations are you using? Core PCE. I mean, I mean, what is the source of the expectations? Oh, we are using the, t the tip spreads where you take uh, inf inflation, uh, uh, okay. Treasury inflation protected securities and not inflation protected securities and you measure the difference between that that's um, one way to measure inflation expectations by the market but as we have mentioned the actual number might be slightly distorted because the Fed has bought so many of these treasuries and there's also the inflation s survey by the University of Michigan that you can use mm -hmm. okay what information are you getting from the University of Michigan survey well um, it is it is actually quite similar to the tips um, spreads because uh, there were um, now what is the exact number here on the chart 2.7 you think that's below mandate consistent levels well it's been co uh, consistent with the, uh, the University of Michigan studies that usually inflation expectations are higher than what they usually turn out to be and so we feel that um, 2.7 is um, is um, still considerably low also if you see historically uh, inflation expectations of mi the Michigan survey have been slightly higher the, uh, than the actual expected inflation and the inflation that does occur in the economy, which is mainly due to uh, the fact that it's based more on people's expectation on the overall economy rather than the core uh, goods that are measured in the inflation. And and we believe that inflation is currently below what the Fed wants because Chairman has signaled this in his uh, past statements without specifically mentioning what the Fed's target for inflation is. And also we've made it a point to make sure that any surveys of inflation expectations are also taken in context of actual inflation in terms of shorter term treasury yields. Although inflation expectations have been increasing, actual yields and actual inflation, actual inflation has remained below mandate consistent levels. Okay, one um, more follow-up. Um, you mentioned uh, the FOMC's implicit um, inflation target of 1.5% to 2%. Um, would you recommend that that's a good number to have, or would you prefer to have something either higher or lower? I mean, historically, 2% has been the level of inflation that economy wants to see. And I know that some other central banks are... Um, suggesting that we increase to, say, a 4% inflation so that over the long run, its average is around 2%. However, we believe that around a one7 to 2% is appropriate. And 
I believe that that is a level that we can actually hit given the economic circumstances. Especially we've tried to increase inflation at this point, but we have not been as successful as we want it to be. Based on that, I think about a 2% inflation target is both reasonable and consistent with what we have done in the past. Also, one discussion that we had over the presentation was about tightening the actual range, which is something that if the Fed does decide to go ahead and make an explicit target, is something they should consider. It does give them a little more flexibility in terms of the ranges they can implement. They can have a 1.7 to 2 target. They can have a 1.8 to 2.1 target. So a tighter range also gives them a little more flexibility. And I would say that we actually have disagreement in our group ourselves because some members like myself, I would actually believe that in the current situation, it would be better to have a higher inflation target so that you can actually use that to spur aggregate demand. Thank you. So this is a pretty interesting time to be doing this because there's been a lot of scrutiny um, on the Fed. So uh, I, I, I assume you've enjoyed all this. Um, one thing that's come up that's caught my attention is uh, some renewed calls uh, for going back on the gold standard. And uh, I wondered what you guys thought of the pros and cons of the gold standard and if there's any merit at all in that suggestion. Uh, I feel that the going back to the gold standard would be um, a very bad move. Uh, because the gold standard, you can't have flexibility with your monetary policy because a growth in the money supply would be a growth in gold mined. And so you can't have a reliable economy based on the how much you can mine gold out of the ground. And so the fact that you have a fiat currency allows you to increase the money supply more easily um, if there's a recession. It would be especially bad if only one country like the U.S. went on it because other countries could do monetary expansion. On the other hand, the U.S. would be stuck to uh, what they have, which wouldn't allow them to expand uh, their monetary policy as much as they might have liked to. And also, also, sorry. Also, the, um, the U.S. is the number one holder of gold bullion at this time. So if the entire world went on it, we would temporarily uh, benefit. However, I mean, having a money system that is fixed to a commodity has a lot of inherent risks because the production is not steady and it's possible. Like, what if they find a gold mine in Papua New Guinea? Our entire world monetary system is awry. And if the, if the ultimate goal here is um, smoothness or more consistency across global currencies, I think rather than the gold standard, personally, I feel that things that need to be explored are calls made by China, for instance, to study special drawing rights of the IMF being considered as more of a reserve currency as opposed to going back to a gold standard. And I would like to tighten this, uh, take this whole thing back to the Great Depression, where at that point, you had, just like um, recently, you had different factors like velocity of money and the money multiplier change. And in a situation where you are on the gold standard, you cannot effectively raise the amount of money put into the system. And if velocity and both money multiplier changes, that can have negative effects on the economy as a whole. Thank you. Um, another question I had was about, um, I think at some point, if I understood correctly, one of you said that the housing market is a significant factor affecting inflation. And um, I'm curious to know how, what, what exactly is the channel through which the housing market, which is at this point just a small fraction of economic activity, um, an important factor in inflation? Well, housing is one of the main assets that people hold. And so their increase in prices up until uh, the bubble burst, I believe, did factor into inflation, especially because people thought that their personal wealth was going to keep increasing as the value of their home increased. But now that people's most major asset is actually not working in their favor at this point is really hurting their expectations. Except for the wealth effect, wealth effect also uh, at, in the uh, PCE, you have the rents that contribute to inflation. So any kind of weakness is also represented in that inflation index. Also, because housing is, is, is an asset that, has been, that can be used in transactions like refinancing, it also does affect demand and consumption in other sectors of the economy, which is why we feel that it really is a very significant component in inflation and aggregate demand. And then one other question I wanted to ask on, um, you were talking about uh, consumer sentiment, and I think one of you mentioned that consumer, cons consumer sentiment is moving up. And I have to say that's one of the first times I've heard somebody positively characterize consumer sentiment right now. Um, because if you look at a longer graph, it's a lot weaker. So I'm, in I'm interested in your take on consumer sentiment. Sure, consumer sentiment is de uh, depressed if you look at a longer term. However, if you look at a short term, it's uh, where uh, the, the data that just came out at 10 a.m., said that it was a five-month high, and it was higher than analyst projections. Yeah. So we feel that the economy is trending upwards. And so, of course, we're in a depressed state right now. But because we're trending upwards, my character would believe that further quantitative easing may work to overheat the economy 
and cause unnecessary stimulus. So if the jobs report came out, you know, zero jobs created on Friday, would you, uh, would you temper your view of how, how, how bullish you are on the economy? I, I would feel that if there was a, a jobs report that was uh, below analyst expectations or, or it was a poor jobs report, then definitely quantitative easing would be something that would be very seriously considered. But also, jobs are normally created with a time lag between uh, the actual growth of productivity and in terms of uh, per hour uh, dollar rates for jobs and the actual jobless claims. Hence, even if the data is slightly weak, we need to look at all the other indicators in perspective and see where exactly it is going, rather than just looking at one number by itself. Thank you. Um, I think it was Christina that said something effect of ex the interest on excess reserves sets the floor for the Fed funds rate, but we're seeing the Fed funds rate trade below that floor. I was wondering if you might provide an explanation as to why we observe that. Um, one of the main reasons behind that is that not all depository institutions that are involved in the federal funds market are eligible to receive interest on excess reserves. One of the major examples being government-sponsored uh, government -sponsored enterprises. So that has kind of bifurcated that market almost. And, and so despite the fact that the federal funds rate is trading below interest on excess reserves, which is a very unusual occurrence, we are not really seeing as much arbitrage on those rates as one would expect. Um, we talk, you talked a little bit about structural unemployment. What data would you look at to identify if you had structural unemployment? Um, one of the major data that we looked at as far as structural unemployment goes, and I think this was research uh, publicized by the Boston Fed, was that the, although, although job vacancies are, uh, are increasing, unemployment numbers are not going down um, in proportion as the pattern has been over the last few um, recoveries. So job, that kind of shows a mismatch between skill sets and vacancies being created. And uh, we studied that in context of the Nehru and an upper adjustment of that. Oh, yeah. Just, I was just going to add that, that many economists have projected that the Nehru has adjusted upwards. And so while it might not be at the current level of unemployment, um, because it has adjusted upwards, that shows that there are significant structural problems in the economy. Okay, and to add to that, if as we had shown on page eight, if you look at the exact losses in jobs, if it's more than five percent in multiple industries, it shows that it's not just structural. There are more; it's a more cyclical issue, uh, as in the past, where it's only been put, uh, concentrated on one particular sector. It's normally just been that particular sector that has a jobless rate of more than five percent, which is not the case currently. To illustrate the point, that would we would um, contrast that with the excessive job losses in the IT industry, for instance, after the dot com boom. That's not really a pattern that we're seeing in this jobless recovery. And you also have to take into account the emergency unemployment benefits that were handed out that might actually raise the yeah. un unemployment number. And it's really difficult to contrast today's unemployment numbers from the past because the 99 weeks of unemployment benefits totally distorts the composition of that. Do you really think the incentive effects of staying unemployed are that high? Some economists project that it could be from 0.5% to 1% uh, added to the unemployment. Uh, certainly, we can all think of anecdotal stories of people that choose not to get a job because not only would the job that they get have to be sim uh, comparable to the unemployment benefits that they are receiving, but it also has to be enough to motivate them to actually go work as opposed to collecting unemployment because collecting unemployment is free money as opposed to getting a job. You'd have to make more than those unemployment benefits and the added work. There are also papers re released by the San Francisco Fed that support that argument. Let, let me ask you one quick last sure. question, putting on my professor hat. Now that you've participated in the Fed Challenge, mm -hmm. what's the most important thing you've learned? Um, I believe that one of the most important things that we've learned is going into this, uh, the Federal Reserve, I just knew the basics. And, and when I look at some of the things that uh, people like Sarah Palin are coming out with, I understand why they don't understand the Fed because it's extremely complicated and unless you have a background in some form of monetary economics, it's really difficult to understand what the Fed is doing. So I understand why people in the public don't know what's going on or are upset because they don't understand it and it's an extremely difficult job on the part of the Fed to communicate with the people as a whole, not just uh, 
individual companies and industries. So you guys have a big burden on your shoulders. And I have to say, as, as our personal views on monetary policy and the Fed have evolved as we've studied and uh, researched for this, we've come to realize um, why there is so much dissent on the FOMC and how there really are, in fact, two or sometimes many more than two sides to any economic aspect. Another very interesting thing that I learned was, first, I was also a believer in the fact that there might be hyperinflation because of this monetary expansion. Based on now the study of tools and the overall economy, it's pretty obvious that it will not go into the hyperinflation state that, let's say, Zimbabwe had, or even to, a, let's say, a 10% level. It's probably going to remain between the 2 to 3% level, and we should be able to control that effectively. And you know, doing this, you basically get a... Uh view from inside the Fed, as opposed to, for example, you read in the news also how uh, other foreign countries have had dissent into quantitative easing too because they thought the U.S. was competitively devaluing all this sort of stuff. But you, you do realize that the Fed has a domestic goal and it looks at the domestic economy does not actually try to devalue it competitively to gain advantage. I also learned that the FOMC boardroom <clears throat> is fairly well appointed. <laughs> <laughs> and there are no right answers in economics. Yeah. Thank you very much.